This is Inside the Courtroom, the Lori Vallow trial. We are glad you are here with us as we take you in depth inside the courtroom to this trial that we have now been watching for, is it, are we in our fifth week yeah. of this trial? So each day, Alex has been in that courtroom, um, you know, really bringing us those details as they happen following all of your updates on Twitter. And then here, we're able to really kind of give you some of that information that we aren't able to get to on the newscasts or, or online and, and maybe give you some perspective on maybe why some of the things are happening that we've seen happen. So this week, some interesting uh, interesting testimony with the last, our last episode, we talked about uh, Ian Pulowski. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess, you know, getting a little bit more into what we heard from him as his testimony continued, um, he, this is, let's explain who he is first. Let's break that down. So Ian Pulowski is the hus- the now husband of Melanie Pulowski, who used to be Melanie Boudreau. Right. And Melanie, Melanie Boudreau was married to Brandon Boudreau. And, um, she, excuse me, so they got divorced. And, like, in the middle of their separation, Brandon was, a, like, shot at. So somebody attempted to shoot him. And this is kind of where this whole investigation started. Yeah. Um, and also Melanie Pulowski is Lori Vallow's niece. So right. they're all kind of interconnected. Um, mm-hmm. And Melanie and Ian ended up getting married, um, I, I believe, four years ago in Vegas after dating for like 10 days. So And he was able to, to kind of shed some light on Melanie's um, kind of thought process, things that he she had told him, right? Yeah, exactly. So the, the problem was that Ian's testimony kind of, I, I think the prosecution thought that his testimony was going to hinge on these recordings because the FBI asked him to record conversations with Chad Laurie, um, Chad Laurie and Melanie, his mm-hmm. wife. Um, and b- he did, but they they weren't admitted in court that like the defense said that this was hearsay. The judge agreed and mm-hmm. we know hearsay is like secondhand information. So he said, she said, she told him, like telling someone else and then that right. person tells you that's what hearsay is. So that's not admissible in court. So the judge Even though agreed. the conversations were between Ian himself and these, yes, these other people. And I don't know what these recordings say, but if it is considered hearsay, it's possible that mm-hmm. someone in the recording was telling him, I heard this from somebody right. else. So yeah. it wasn't admissible. I don't know. what that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, but, um, basically, uh, Archibald, Jim Archibald, Lori Vall's attorney referred to him as like a snitch and mm-hmm. the prosecution objected to this. And, um, basically they just had to continue with his testimony anyway. And so he kind of shed light on, um, how he thought Melanie was being manipulated by Lori and that um, Lori was trying to get something out of Melanie, but there wasn't evidence of it. Um, and we all assumed she was going to testify. Melanie and, herself, right? Yes. Yeah. And because she was she was super close with Lori. She's like Lori's, you know, um, I guess she referred to Lori as like her mother figure. Mm-hmm. Um, and they lived in the same apartment complex. So they were very close. And basically we knew she was in the courthouse, but then we got word that she had left with Ian. So Hmm. we don't know if she's coming back. Like uh, maybe the defense could call her back if she's still under subpoena, but we don't know. They didn't really address it um, in court. So interesting. So we talked about that last time. We we assumed perhaps that she would take the stand um, for the prosecution, potentially if she left, maybe that's not happening. We'll have to see if that that, um, happens. They do, they will continue their testimony um, next week. Um, You know, we think probably we'll see the prosecution wrap up next week just because they seem to be getting sort of toward the end of their of their evidence. Um, Some things now still coming out with Chad Daybell and his um, uh, kind of, you know, how he went about insurance because that's one of the big things here is you know how were that fraud that fraud piece of how were they going to misuse exactly misuse some of the financial um you know financial the the money that they were going to get because of the deaths of tammy jj and tiley right yeah i mean so yesterday basically this insurance broker testified that chad came into her office literally i think three days after tammy had died And um, she said that it was unusual for someone to come in so soon after someone's spouse has died. Um, Excuse me. (laughs) And um, and so she said, well, you need a death certificate for, you know, to be able to claim this insurance money, which, by the way, was one hundred and thirty thousand dollars. So and and I think her insurance was actually upped at some point. So he was able to get that one hundred thirty thousand dollars. But um he when she tells him that i need this death certificate he goes well don't worry i've already ordered eight of them 
And so that was kind of like a red flag. Yeah. And so I think that that Most kind of... Most people for, don't even realize or don't think about that because they're overwhelmed by what's going with on. With grief or something. Yeah, it's it was just very... It's not of, expected, you know, like sudden. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And so, um, and you know, then we kind of move into like uh, when... And I think actually he and wanted to put Lori on his insurance plan too. And when the insurance asked, do you, does she have any kids? He says no. Mm -hmm. So this is like... Right. After. And again, very quick. Uh, yeah. All of these things happening very quickly. Um, and then also, you know, with with the the financial piece of this, I mean, increasing in insurance benefits, perhaps again, circumstantial. Yes. Um, but interesting, especially if there was no real reason to or, or nobody. It didn't seem to make, you know, there was no obvious reason to do that. Yeah. Um, and then and we know Lori was living off of Charles Vallow's insurance, like her, mm -hmm. her former husband. Um, and so, yeah, it just, it was clear that they, like the prosecution, it was clear that the prosecution is saying they wanted this money. Mm -hmm. They said that they didn't have any kids. They were trying to live off this money. Yeah. And there was, um, video played of police serving Lori with an order basically saying produce your kids in, in January of 2020. Um, in Hawaii. And so there's like this video of them at the pool. She's in like this big, or I think she's in like a teal swimsuit and she's, I think she's reading a book and she's with Chad. Um, and they give her the order and they're like, do you have any questions? And she says, no, say, have a nice day. They move on. And then boom, the next day they're searching her car. So basically they found in like the car in the condo, they found Jay, Jay's birth certificate. They found Tylee's credit cards, laptops. They found, I think 15 copies of Charles Vallow's death certificate. Hmm. So that's, I mean, I, I think that's yeah. a lot. Well, and I <laughs> but, was going, I can't help, but, but be reminded when you're talking about, Chad's response to Lori's ever uh, to um, to Tammy's death, I I'm immediately reminded about Lori's response following what we now know about her response about Charles Vallow's death. I mean, because we've heard that you know the the calling to figure out w why she you know wh how she was able to get it, get the the payment and finding out that she wasn't the beneficiary. The beneficiary. But yeah, and that right? was kind of testified to a little bit today. Mm -hmm. um, basically you know, just her lack of response mm -hmm. surrounding his death and telling people different things about how he died. Right. Um, and so, you know, getting into a little bit about today, like Douglas Hart was on the stand and he's a former FBI agent. And he said that he went through, I mean, he was like the the main FBI agent for this yeah, case. Yeah, he so was a he, special agent in charge and, and for like more than two decades. Yeah, in this he has area. 27 mm -hmm. years of experience. Right. He's, yeah. So he said that he had to go through, I think, 4,500 like text messages, records, yeah. all this thousands and thousands of um, like pieces of data on um, Lori Bellow's two iCloud accounts. So Lori for Style and then Lolly Time was another one. And um, he went through so many text messages and we didn't get through all of them today, but he did make this comment today that um, kind of that really set in stone, I feel like what we're about to see, because mm -hmm. he said there were discussions between Chad and Lori about the children's death. So I'm 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 right. really like I don't know what that entails, but I'm assuming that we're going to see something on Monday, mm -hmm. um, in regards to their deaths. Right. Um, but basically today was just all going through, um, laying the foundation mm -hmm. of their text messages, right? So, kind of giving you the the themes or the things that he the things that obviously kind of red flags for him, and then yeah. that's interesting because we have talked before about about that was another one of the very specific points that um, that there was a, some concern about, I guess, if there, if there were questions and if you were going to look at what looks good for the defense, it was that we hadn't seen any specific text messages or anything between Chad and Lori directly or between Lori and Alex that were specifically speaking about the death of the children, the death of Tammy. And so <coughs> this testimony from Doug Hart, who is now the, the chief deputy of the Canyon County Sheriff's Office, but he's, he's, uh, he is speaking on behalf as a, an FBI, a former FBI agent. Um, and so that's where that, that expertise comes in. And he was the lead investigator on this case and, and yeah. worked that. And so it'll be interesting, as you said, I, I would be, it'd be surprising if they didn't get into those very spe the specific words that were said. And these come from the iCloud. So does that mean that they were taken 
were they cleared off of phones, deleted, but then they were able to find them? So I don't actually know specifically if she had deleted these text messages, but he said that they are able to recover text messages if it backs up to the iCloud. So like you mm-hmm. can delete text messages from your phone, but if they back up to your iCloud, like yeah. they're going to find, they're going to find those. Um, and what's interesting is he, he laid the foundation for Charles and he also laid a little bit of foundation but for like Chad and Lori's relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that's where we ended. So basically with Charles, um, we know Lori's friend Audrey testified on Wednesday. Mm-hmm. There were text messages so- shown between them where Lori was saying, hey, just want to talk to you about some stuff. It's good to talk to people who know. And Hart said, well, Audrey knew about Chad and Lori at this point. Mm -hmm. And so what his interpretation was, is that Chad was trying to make Audrey like their liaison. So he was trying to communicate to Lori through Audrey and back and forth because he wanted, in Hart's words, he, Chad wanted to wait until Tammy Daybell died to actually communicate directly with Lori, I think. Mm-hmm. Even though to avoid the, something getting caught, or potentially to avoid something being seen, exactly, or who knows. right, exactly. And so then there's like some text between Alex and Lori about um, Charles' body still being alive, and Alex, and then Lori saying, "I'm working on it," and and, and things like that. Okay, hmm. so then we move into like uh, Lori. This this actually was really devastating. So Cole Vallow and Zach Vallow yeah. are Charles Vallow's kids, right? Right, and. Lori told them that their dad died through a text message. Right. Which, personally, if that happened to me, I feel like that would be the worst way to go about it because that's sure. just a shock. And on, and so she Especially says... Especially from a, a stepmom. I mean, this is the person that is married to your dad. Whether or not you see her as a, as a mom figure, at, at the very least, this is the wife of your father and the one person who has all of that information because as soon as someone tells you that your father just passed away and you were not expecting that you're going to have a lot of questions oh you're going to have all sorts of questions which is is exactly what they did yeah so they she said hey i have very sad news your father passed away yesterday i'm still waiting on the medical examiner um but i'm trying to keep you informed of what's going on or something and then she said i'm not sure how to handle things just know that your dad loved you and they literally are like, wait, Lori, what happened? And then they say, she doesn't respond. So then they say, Lori, what the bleep happened? Um, our dad died and you disappear. You can't just tell us our dad died and disappear. And where were, how far apart were they? So where are they like living at that time? Um, I'm actually not sure where, where they're living, but I know that they're, they kept in con- close contact with him. Okay. They said that they talked frequently and... Um, Basically, they these kids also knew about Colby and, and Tylee, and I, you know, have probably interacted with them before. So they even asked about Colby and Tylee. They're like, "Well, what do Colby and Tylee know?" And they even said, "Is JJ safe?" <laughs> like, which was really harrowing because you know mm-hmm. what happens to JJ later. But they were seriously concerned, and she didn't respond. I don't even think she. I don't know if she responded to them at all, but it days went by, like five wow. days went by, and they were still texting her and saying, "What happened?" <laughs> And, and, you know, then we move into the texts sure. with Chad right. to lay their yeah. relationship out. So really difficult to make any sense of it in terms of, you know, w- what would explain that? Um, because it would be one thing if we had information or, or somebody was able to show us that, you know, she was, she was grieving. She went into some sort of uh, shock. You know, that happens. Yeah. But instead, what we know is that she was telling people that, you know multiple different stories about how he passed away yeah and she was talking she was speaking with chad at this point right and even before this point she had saved chad's number in her phone as um bishop shumway so like as like a fake name a decoy decoy. Mm -hmm. um and so like obviously they were we know that they were communicating and having this affair and then charles dies and you know her kid the his kids are just devastated and i remember them putting up a text where i think one of them said are there any plans for a funeral we would like to be a part of this please let us know Hmm. just and you know they actually um his family was in the courtroom in the beginning of the trial so it's it's honestly really really heartbreaking i think that yeah and so you you know you're reminded of all the different families and we've heard that summer's very emotional testimony you know um colby's very emotional pleas to his mom yeah there are so many people Um, whose lives were just affected by this just exactly the worst in the worst way yeah i mean even brandon you know he's separated from melanie but he still has 
kids with her and they're mm -hmm. they have ongoing litigation it, like everything is connected like we said before it's just yeah. this like complete spiral of of information and everything is is looped in some way so yeah but you know and then like even so between her and chad these texts are very intimate mm -hmm. um he talks about taking a shower with her and like uh like kind of like a sexual like flirtatious things. kind of messages, yeah but yeah. more like like sexual things and um so he tells her good morning um getting ready for my meetings i love you so much you are my greatest desire now on with the story and their story is that they lived uh they were together in past lives right. you know she was elena he was james and they were together they were married and now they're ma married in this uh earthly life mm -hmm. um and Hart said that uh, basically these things manifested into, like he was reading a text that said these manifest into physical desires. So then Chad texts her, our spirits were making love and like all this stuff about how they're interconnected and their spirits are entwined and they're at, uh, they're at one essentially. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, and so Lori's texting him that she loves him um, and they kind of go into that and yeah, Chad, Chad texts her all these things about, you know, their spirituality and past lives and, um, their like goals together and things like that. And so we mm -hmm. kind of got into that a little bit today and it was very interesting to see, you know, how sp I guess specific and like intimate their relationship was, right. you know, just in the middle of all, you know, knowing that parallel are exactly, exactly. Two children are, are missing and now we know dead we have tammy daybell dying so i mean all of this truly traumatic horrific these yeah. horrific things happening around them and yet those that's the interaction between the two of them which and he's still like even in, like so in one of the texts he calls like he calls i think tammy's potential death like hoopla like he says um hey by the way my kids are getting their uh bachelor's and associate's degree um but i feel that tammy will be gone by then and then mm. i'll still have all this hoopla to deal with but i'm gonna have family in town i might not get to be with you until this is over so please ask about that or something so like she, they're very um i guess honest with each other yeah. at the very least sure um but also very connected and then again at the same time telling we know during the investigation telling police he didn't know her he didn't yeah. he, you know barely knew her didn't even have her phone number um i mean so again just so many different pieces and parts that, that just simply don't add up well even um, and e it's, even so like when we spoke about melanie just a little yeah. while ago yeah. so her one of her texts with Lori was was put up for the jury okay. and so i and everyone's been saying like well if she gets on the stand she, could she incriminate herself and these text messages i don't know how much more we're going to see with um between Lori and melanie but the texts so two days before charles Vallow was shot by alex cox Lori's brother um she Lori texts her and says they have a plan and so then melanie replies well i could take the babies with me we could take our stuff and then Lori texts her back and says we're we have to stay here to defend ourselves um everything is coming to a head this week it will change everything and she also told alex wow. that she said everything will come to a head this week and then two days later charles is dead so interesting it's interesting because you know what if melanie thinks that i mean like what right. is going to happen if melanie right. gets on the stand and in these text messages are shown like how is that going to affect her mm -hmm. and 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 what's going to happen with her i mean we don't know right. so but we do know that if she is under a subpoena and we believe she still is under we believe she is under a subpoena um she is compelled to testify if someone calls her to testify and she is subpoenaed by the court it is a it is a can be a criminal charge a contempt of court if she weren't to do that so your point about you no know, she won't be she won't have to incriminate herself but what will that really show us yeah. if she is if she does start to answer and it'll be very interesting to see her perspective and i i have a hard time not wondering about 
Ian and she I um, in that dynamic just because you know, here's the defense attorney calling in a snitch. He agreed to help the yeah. FBI. And, and we, you know, if you're not involved, you can understand absolutely why you would do that. To, well, and then, you like, know. how is their relationship after all right. this? Because, yes. you know, Ian helped the FBI and mm-hmm. Melanie was very close with Lori. And Ian believes Melanie was being manipulated, but we don't really know, I mean, yeah. what happened there. And, and Or Melanie's perspective at this point today, how she's feeling or what she's thinking. Yeah, we have no idea. And, and, and again, like, the prosecution can have people on their witness list and decide not to call them, right? Because they have to realize what benefits their case in the end. So it could be possible that the defense thinks Melanie will benefit them and call her, Mm -hmm. but we just don't know that. Right. And and as you said, defense can have the same thing. She can sit on a subpoena list. She can have a subpoena and they simply, you know, quash that and never, and never use it, never call her. Um, But that will be definitely one we're going to want to watch because that is a name that has been closely tied uh, to all of the interactions, and as you said, one of Lori's biggest supporters, um, and we think continues to be a supporter, at least was one of the the longest uh, standing supporters and, and looked up to Lori, and so it'll be interesting to see well, what she has to say. And even like previous court documents have said that she would die before she gave up Lori and Chad, yeah. so like we know that they were close. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you know, then again on, on Monday, like today ended early, so we weren't able to finish the FBI agent or the former FBI agent's testimony, Mm -hmm. but hopefully on Monday, we're going to see really specific detail as to completely tie up all these loose ends here with these text messages from Lori's account, because that's what we were all waiting on. It's like, what does Lori have in her phone? Sure. You know? And so on Monday, hopefully we'll see more of, of that. And and he said, like they discussed the deaths of Tammy, JJ and Tylee. So, that's what we're waiting on at this point. And all the while getting little glimpses into what we might see when Chad Daybell goes to trial. Yeah, and his trial, I mean, they just had a hearing from yesterday, and they're looking at June 2024, so that's a year away. away. So, I mean, yeah. he waived his right. speedy trial, and he is still subject to the death penalty. Lori is not. So, right. you know. Could we change, don't. right? That could mean that they could go through the same process and, and potentially that not be on the table any longer. Um, but we at least get have a, a little bit um, more insight onto what that timeline will likely be. And of course, we will keep watching that. We will be in the courtroom again on Monday and we will bring you all of the details from inside the courtroom, the Lori Vallow trial, when we meet next. <laughs> 